What do oxen, madhouses, the last duel, and leeches have in common? <sighs> Another episode of Queen Charlotte. <laughs> Cheerio, everyone. This is D Movie Man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic, coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And today, of course, I'm coming to you all with another episode of Queen Charlotte, Season 1, Episode 4, Holding the King. This episode is directed by Tom Verica and written by Nicholas Nardini, who was previously written for the series Scandal and inventing Anna. And now, let us commence. So we open up this episode picking up right where we left off at the end of the previous one. We see Charlotte and Reynolds tending to the king after his garden excursion. And Charlotte is angered, bewildered, and completely unable to understand just what has happened to her husband. We then flash back to George months prior where he is explaining the resourcefulness of horses compared to oxen to some local farmers. That's before he's interrupted by his mother, Princess Augusta, who was sent for him to discuss his new bride. George is not interested in whatever noblewoman has been chosen for him, nor has he any interest in being the royal stud horse trotted out for the chosen mare. <laughs> Unfortunately for him, England is currently in a sad state of affairs, so his role as king is more imperative than ever. An heir must be made, the lineage must be secured, and that outcome will be determined by none other than Sophia Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitz However, when George is informed that Charlotte is currently making her way to England on a ship, he devolves into a fit of panic and confusion, similar to what we've recently seen. Princess Augusta immediately demands that everyone withdraw from the room as she attempts to comfort her ailing son. Later, a physician suggests that these symptoms remain consistent with an inflamed cerebellum. Another physician attributes it to ill humor in his legs. But at this point, Princess Augusta is tired of all the theories and horrible treatments. It is a week before the king's wedding, and he is still as before. Another gentleman suggests that the issue is not merely physical, but nervous. However, such a suggestion is considered treason, punishable by death. But it appears that Dr. John Monroe of the Bethlehem Hospital, aka the Madhouse, feels fairly confident that he can solve the king's great issue. And he can do so with a mere conversation. This proves to be true as he is eventually able to snap King George out of his disorientation. We circle back around to the wedding day, and everything appears to be progressing as it did before. But this time, we see George running into the doctor after hearing of Charlotte's disappearance. George is nervous, trembling, and obviously very disconnected, which the doctor resolves to fix by placing his hands over George's, and then proceeding to slap the ever-loving out of him. Okay, I, I mean, it seems to have worked. I mean, he's, he's snapped out of it, but I'm just like, uh, I don't know. Something's a little off here. George thanks the doctor for his assistance, and he also calls off the guards who have prepared themselves to attack. We then see George approach Charlotte as their faithful meeting comes full circle. We then hit our title card and we continue on watching the events of the day play out as we saw previously, but this time it's from George's vantage point. And let me just say really quickly, whether it's books, movies, or TV shows, I always enjoy the idea of seeing something happen from someone else's vantage point or seeing it from a different perspective. Even in life, we all interpret things very differently and, you know, how we see a situation, how we see something play out, you know, our interpretation and all that, it can vary easily, you know, just based on how we think, based on how we see the world, so on and so forth. So that's something I always find interesting, even like in sitcom episodes where something happens and someone has this one extreme of the story 
and the other person has this complete opposite extreme and then we find out the truth is somewhere in the middle but it's still fun seeing like just what those extremes look like and to use a more recent example i really enjoyed the last duel directed by ridley scott i think what really made that film stand out for me along with the great performances the cinematography the period piece nature of it was seeing the story play out through these three vantage points and we think that we're getting one aspect of the story and we figure okay well there's this part there's this part but then as we go between the three it's like wait a minute and the idea of what the truth actually is and how these people see themselves and how everything plays out it's interesting but it's also kind of scary because it's like how do you see the hero in the situation and then how do you see yourself as you know the innocent person like it's just it's crazy to think that people have this idea of themselves and then the reality of it is something completely different so that was a great film but it was a very tough watch i must say but definitely a film that made a great use of that as far as perception so again I think the fact that this episode is playing out from George's vantage point, we're seeing all these moments play out with a different, you know, background, with a different lens, I thought that was such a great idea. We then follow the king immediately after his blow up with Charlotte on their wedding night. We see him arriving to his home in queue while he and Reynolds make their way to the observatory. When Reynolds inquires about the king's issue with Charlotte, it turns out to be the complete opposite of what he initially assumed. Charlotte is both beautiful and clever, which now exposes George's own flaws. Hence, he hopes to keep her far, far away, safe from him and his deformity. And I will say that going back to the first episode when George pushed back against the idea of being with Charlotte on their wedding night, I already knew it had something to do with that. I wasn't sure, you know, I wasn't 100%, but I was like, I'm pretty sure that's what this is. And of course, now we're seeing yeah, he wants to keep her safe. He wants to stay far away because if she is around him for any extended amount of time, the secret will be out and then what's going to happen next? We also see Charlotte arriving in queue, which Reynolds informs George of only moments prior. And we already know how that conversation plays out with Charlotte leaving in frustration. We then see George speaking with Dr. Monroe the next day. George's anxiety over Charlotte potentially discovering his ailment has led him to request changes in the doctor's treatment. Not something to stop the fits once they start, but something to end them permanently. Conveniently, the doctor has been working on a new practice treatment, but it would require him to have access to the king at all times and license to pursue more extreme measures and george is in full agreement with this i was like mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. this does not sound good and from the look on reynolds face he and i are most definitely on the same page unfortunately none of that initial worry proves to be unfounded we soon see the vast disparity between how Charlotte spends her days at Buckingham House and how George spends his days in queue. Apparently, the goal here is to eliminate comfort. So what we see next is George being thrust into ice water, made to eat what looks like gruel, and bound and gagged in a chair where potentially worse things are about to occur. The goal here is to simply discipline his mind. But considering that the doctor also says that George is simply an animal in a cage, and like all animals, he will be broken, it appears that torture is at the forefront of this so-called treatment. Once I realized what was going on here, I was just like, ah. On the one hand, it makes me very appreciative of how far we've come as a society regarding mental health, psychology, and treatments, and all of that. But if you look back at all these treatments and concepts and ideas about the mind and how to treat it and how to deal with it, it was some of the most archaic, brutal, damaging things you could imagine. 
And more often than not, they would exacerbate the issue that was there rather than fix it. It's like you put people in these contraptions, you leech them as we see with George, you, you know, electroshock therapy and all. It's just like, ugh. And I get when you don't know better, you don't know better, but man, like, ooh, I just, I am very grateful to be in a time where that is valued and considered and people understand how important it is. And I hope people continue to understand that because this, as an alternative, yeah, no. But I don't want to go among mad people. Oh, you can't help that. Most everyone's mad here. <laughs> <laughs> and sadly, George doesn't know any better. He just wants to fix the issue, and he assumes that these extreme measures are necessary, even though they're not. We even see Reynolds questioning the doctor's methods, and he reminds George that he is the king, and if he wants to see Charlotte and break out of this whole situation, he has the ability to do so. But in George's mind, this is something he cannot do. But for the moment being, he can at least be near her. We see him then return to Buckingham House, where he is able to observe Charlotte's daily activities that she is currently spending alone. This is where we also see Reynolds taking Brimsley's initial suggestion and suggesting that the king make some sort of gesture towards Charlotte. Something to be with her until he can be. We then realize that the Pomeranian that he has sent Charlotte has been rescued from the doctor's laboratory. It's not to say that it wasn't already a sweet gesture and, you know, and a nice thought, but it definitely adds some context to it and it makes it all the more significant because who knows what was going to happen to that poor dog otherwise. Although I can imagine. <laughs> By sending the dog from his cage to hers, he hopes to assure her that neither of them will be caged forever. Unfortunately, we already know that Charlotte ends up misinterpreting this gift completely. But thankfully, George manages to decline his planned chair experiments and ice baths for the day and manages to venture outdoors once again and be Farmer George once more. Even better, he is more than excited to dine with his wife. Brimsley once again attempts to offer his services to Reynolds, suggesting that they could work together to bring the king and queen together and even assist with the king's condition. Reynolds then does the thing that gets on my nerves every single time he does it. He completely rejects Brimsley and tells him to stay down. Now look, I understand where Reynolds is coming from, I do have some empathy in the fact that he's in between a rock and a hard place. All he can do is convince George to break out of this situation, but if he doesn't, then what else can he do? So I get that he is trying to manage this a certain way, and so he's probably trying to remove Brimsley from the situation and just he doesn't want to overcomplicate it. But listen, this whole thing where you are rude and dismissive and nasty like especially if this is someone you quote unquote care about it's just like yeah that's not gonna fly with me you cannot be in this man's bed one minute and then telling him to stay down and fall back and know his place i'm like uh i got a place for you to go <laughs> okay on fire, feeling hot, hot, hot. however reynolds does once again prove his devotion and loyalty to the king by easing him through a potential attack that threatens to derail his and Charlotte's dinner. Later, after George and Charlotte have officially made peace, George informs Dr. Monroe that he will be officially moving to Buckingham House, which means that their consultations and treatments will, as a consequence, become far less frequent. Later, George also comes to a realization about his life, his circumstances, and how every mistake and potential wrong action has been presented as the potential ruin of England. He then assumed this great terror that was created inside him was the prize for being royal. But now he has met a woman that is never terrified, 
and breaks convention in almost every possible way. And yet, she is the most royal person he has ever known. And with that, he finally realizes it is time for the doctor's dismissal. One, two, three, both. Uh, unfortunately, George has sorely underestimated the doctor's penchant for manipulation. The doctor reveals that he is creating a poultice for the queen, who is now currently with child. Now, whether this is actually the truth remains to be seen. Unfortunately, what should be a happy occasion, if this is true, has the adverse effect sending George into yet another tailspin, which brings us to his sudden attack in the bedroom where he begins scribbling all over the walls. And now we are officially back to the beginning of the episode. George wakes up the next morning to see Charlotte departing. We then see Charlotte meeting with Princess Augusta where she quickly confronts her over George's secret that she is intentionally kept hidden. Princess Augusta quickly becomes emotional referencing the exhaustion her son is experiencing from holding the greatest nation in the world on his shoulders, the very same weight that falls upon her own shoulders as she watches her son deteriorate. And everything up until now has been for his sake. But as Charlotte sees it, this has all been for a lie, which unfortunately, George overhears. And with that, George is once again compelled to continue his treatments with Dr. Monroe. <sighs> we were so, so close, weren't we? And that closes out episode four, Holding the King. Whoo, this episode was not fun to watch or experience. I just, every time Dr. Monroe came on my screen, it's just, Ooh, some really intense feelings just took over my mind and body and I just wanted to ooh, really do some terrible things. And, oh, that's not a good feeling to experience. But I just, ooh, people who take advantage of positions of power in any sense of the word, but especially with mental health, knowing what a minefield that is and knowing how that can, like, completely alter a person's life and their trajectory in life. Whoo! And it's like, this man is the king, but it's like, because of his situation and because of the power dynamic, like, he is allowing himself to deal and put up with circumstances that he shouldn't have to. Like, he can banish this man anytime he wants, and he was going to, but now, you know, like, ah, ah it's, it's, ooh. I am absolutely ready for Dr. Monroe to uh, get his very soon. And as always, please feel free to leave your thoughts down below on this recap and the episode in general. So once again, this is D Movie Man signing off and I'll see you with the movie.